फ्रेंड्स जोहार टुडे वी हैव वेरी स्पेशल गेस्ट अ रिनाउंड एंथ्रोपोलॉजिस्ट ऑथर एंड ग्रेट ग्रेट ग्रैंडसन ऑफ चार्ल्स डार्विन डॉक्टर फेलिक्स पटेल ही हैज रिटन थ्री वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट बुक एंड मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट बुक इज दिस आउट ऑफ अर्थ ही हैज वर्क इन इंडिया for last three decades so i would welcome dr felix patel johar yeah. so would you like to tell us that how did you started your work in india or what made you to work in india thank you i would love to um it's a long story but basically 40 years ago I was doing my first degrees in Oxford University as an ordinary sort of ordinary English person and when I started anthropology my classmate at that time was Amitav Ghosh the writer but then he was just like me an anthropology student and he said Felix if you want to understand India why don't you go and do an MPhil in sociology in Delhi School of Economics because to be frank my teachers there were very deep thinking and very connected with society and it was maybe the best advice i ever got so like so many indians go for higher studies to other countries i am the opposite i came to india for my higher studies and even my phd i did it nominally from oxford but actually my real supervisors were in india and actually i had some really great supervisors in Delhi University but i would say some of my greatest teachers were adivasis just in ordinary villages who began to teach me and so i did my field work i wrote it up and actually the subject of my first book instead of studying tribal people which now seems to me to add insult to injury i was actually I did reverse anthropology so I studied the British rule in India and the power structure they set up over adivasis which in a way still continues in fact talking of human rights the when I showed my first book to a superintendent of police in Orissa he read it very carefully and he said a most amazing thing afterwards he said when the british started the police every time they would go to the tribal village they would demand a bribe and you have written that that is still the case and i'm afraid you're correct he was an honest policeman <laughs> so actually my work in india has always been to understand the power structures that to understand in a human way that is non confrontative how people behave with each other so I've been doing that and adivasis have drawn me in over the years to till I feel part of your society as I do part of Indian society. Felix today is uh, the International Human Rights Day. And when this day comes every year this book gives me different picture. You know it reminds me that for last a decade or so there has been killing after killing of adivasis in chatisgarh odisha jharkhand and other state in this so called red corridor corridor mm -hmm. so in this situation how to celebrate the international human rights day ah that is a really important question it it seems to me like human rights we know how important it is and yet the powerful people and countries give it less and less importance and it's very very sad because if we believe in development of any kind human rights should be absolutely at the center of that it is the most important index and unfortunately india is way down on that index and as you know and I'm sure your viewers know too well. 
Adivasi and Dalit's human rights situation is really often very terrible. Yeah, but then uh, what are the reasons behind this killing of Adivasi? How do you see it? I think one aspect is simply that the human life is not valued and especially the life of the indigenous people or the poor people is not valued. Actually, I saw a headline just some moments ago that gave me some bit of happiness where the Prime Minister of Iceland, a woman, she said to consider the human well-being as more important than the GDP. And with her was the Prime Minister of New Zealand and the Chief woman of Scotland. And this, although they are small countries compared to India or Britain or United States, but this is somehow hopeful for me because, especially comparing to GDP, that everywhere we see, like the minerals is valued more than the advances. The, the, and when you think about it, that is so truly insane that there is so much to value in Adivasi life and human life, and you have to value money. It's, it's the wrong set of values. Actually, Felix, I have been seeing that behind every killing, there one or other way, that killing has some kind of mining link. For example, recently, the Adivasis who were protesting against Adani company in Chhattisgarh, they want to protect their hill, the Bailadela hill. Yeah. So, two of them were caught by the security forces. They took them in the forest and they brutally killed them. Mm -hmm. And the next day, we came through newspaper, it said that two Naxali were killed in mm -hmm. the crossfire. Mm -hmm. So, don't you see that Behind the killing of Adivasis, there is definitely a mining link or a link of the natural resource gap. You know that that is, like you, that is what I especially am looking at. And my book, Out of this Earth, especially, it's looking at like out of this earth instead of valuing yeah. our mother, the earth, and the human beings who live close to the earth. We are valuing these minerals. And as you say, the extractive industries in some countries like Latin America, it is for oil or in the Middle East, it's for oil or gas. In Manipur, it's often those carbon deposits, but in, in Jharkhand especially, the richer the resources, the worse the human rights now. Uh, I could see, you know, it's happening because there is a clear nexus between state and the corporate. So, how do you see this nexus globally? Too, too close. And because I've looked at most in India, and in India it's very ironic because actually the East India Company was bringing British rule here, and it was one of the world's first corporations, and it made it subsidiary organization to collect the revenue, which is why a district magistrate is called a collector, and that subsidiary was called Government of India. That Government of India was the first creation of the East India Company. And even now, when you look at India's mining policy, it says the government policy should be to facilitate the mining companies. It's, and when you see the police, the police, their role should be seva. It should be service to protect people, but they do not give security to the people, they give security to the mining companies. It is absolutely, it is like a real Mafia Raj in the name of mining, destroying our mother the earth. Yeah. And then uh, recently uh, there was a big mobilization globally against the criminalization of indigenous activists. Mm. So can you exp a little bit tell us what kind of criminalization is going across the globe against <coughs> indigenous peoples? I mean, this is happening in, not only in India, it's happening in 
several countries in Latin America, maybe especially Brazil, and also in the Philippines. And the UN Rapporteur for the Rights of Indigenous People, Vicky Tauli Kokos, is an indigenous woman from the Philippines. And their President Duterte actually declared human rights defenders like terrorists. And how more ironic than that can you be? And Vicky Talikopoulos was on the Philippines list of terrorist people who are liable for assassination. And luckily, that has she has been taken off that list. But so many human rights are defenders are killed in Colombia, in in Philippines, in in India, as you know well, in Turkey, and in many other countries. Unfortunately, we India is such a truly wonderful country with such an amazing history. Why, if India could turn that around and become a leader in protecting human rights, yeah. but first the the police should never think they are above the law. They should not be above the law. They yeah. they are supposed to be upholders of the law. How can they be doing what they do? The policemen should be seriously punished. And I have heard in the history that Shivaji, when he was leading his campaigns in, in Maharashtra, he would not tolerate any abuse of women or citizens by his soldiers. And if any soldier stepped out of line and committed atrocities to civilians, even of the enemy, he would finish them. And I mean, especially police soldiers, of course, they have a difficult role, but their discipline should always involved, first and foremost, no tolerance for abuse of civilians. And that is not the situation now, unfortunately. Uh, there has been a hue and cry globally on uh, climate change, impact of, of climate change. Mm. But in India, still, not just in history, but still so-called conservationist, and uh, economists, they want to eliminate Adivasi from the forest. Mm -hmm. So, can you tell us that what kind of, you know, connection is there between Adivasi and forest? Because I am writing and many other Adivasi mm -hmm. writers are now writing that without forest, there won't be life. And without, without Adivasi, there won't be forest. So, can you explain all this? Well, I'm very, very happy that you have released your book, Adivasis and Their Forest, because like the Forest Act, Act, Rights Act was meant to correct the historic injustice, and yet we know how badly it's been implemented. And the historic injustice, to me, as a British person, comes from the worst thing that the British did in India, <clears throat> when they created the Forest Department and they undermined the traditional rights of the tribal people to the forest, because it's not just rights that every tribal person traditionally would observe many nigam, many rules of taboos, of restraint in what they would take from nature. They would hunt, they would take from the forest, but they know the limits, they know each species better than the forest officers know. And the sensitive of forest officers, when I've met them, they recognize Adivasi knowledge of the forest is much superior to theirs. And the conservationists, especially, they should know better. And actually, many conservationists in India and worldwide have said the um, Supreme Court ruling on, on this issue is completely um, out of order. That's a few days ago, I was hearing in Nagaholi National Park in Karnataka how the Tribal people who have lived there for centuries, since before history began, they, those who have been displaced from the forest, the old people even died within the, the first three years of displacement, many sooner than that. And there is massive pressure on them even now to leave. And same in Madhya Pradesh, same in other states, in Simlipal and Orissa, I believe. And this is, it's not only a, a massive injustice, it's the worst thing for the forest. 
actually essence you spoke about this forest rights right so what i have found is that adivasi and other traditional forest dwellers are not being given forest right precisely because the indian state is committed to hand over the natural resources to the mining company exactly yeah that is many uh, cases i have recorded in this book yeah so it is very difficult to get uh, our forest right uh, these days uh, since we are talking about adivasis and you have written a book uh, ecology economy yeah so i would like you to connect that how ecology and economy can be you know future for the world sure thank you well i mean i think i have coined the phrase adivasi economics because in the traditional economy as i understand it that adivasis have practiced it that has been recorded by anthropologists and many others the economy that they practice is one not not based on making a profit from other people or resources but simply taking from nature to the limit that is understood because they understand the ecosystem unfortunately econo- economists are not trained to understand the ecosystem so they plan these projects for taking from nature without understanding the limits of growth the limits of what nature can support and especially when you look at water how the factories how the mining damages the water systems it is completely insane and i think this connection between the indigenous people and nature is why that the cochabamba declaration that i i feel would be very helpful for adivasis to understand that was the declaration of many indigenous people coming together in bolivia in april 2010 where they asserted the rights of mother earth or the rights of nature because in election time as it is now nature the indigenous species the mountains the rivers they have no vote so indigenous people are often actually standing up as they are in the mountains in chatiska in orissa in jharkhand they against mining they are standing up for the rights of the mountain to exist and to continue to exist as a source of life and water and those rights of nature should be at one with the rights of adivasis and like the un declaration on the rights of indigenous people the cochabamba declaration by indigenous people on the rights of nature these need to come together and the niamgiri movement why it succeeded to the extent it has done so far is because environmentalists and adivasi rights activists were on the same side because the dongria are so clear as an example of protecting the forest on the mountains so for me it is very very important they they come together and to understand the rights of nature can only properly be implemented the the future of nature the future which means our future too adivasis are the guardians of that uh, i could sense uh, you know some kind of emergence of not actually the mid, uh, middle class i can say but then obviously after 1950 through the constitution of india this reservation came and through the reservation many adivasis got big government jobs mm-hmm. and then they started living with non adivasi people and then they started coping them yeah yeah because uh, they did because they were forced they were always shown as a you know portrayed as they are savage uncivilized backward and yeah. so and so yeah yeah and because of this kind of you know identity crisis yeah. a small uh, number of or percentage of people say emerge as a middle class yes and because of this emergence now what's happening these people who have made a small uh, kind of colony i would say yeah. they are advocating for uh, for you know assimilation of adivasi with so called mainstream yeah, yeah. but the majority of the adivasi want to live with the nature yeah. so can you give some kind of message 
how we can club this together. Yeah, the emergence of class in Adivasi society is yeah. more and more visible. And <clears throat> one of the ways that I have understood it is formed is because, as you say, the inferiority complex mm -hmm. has been pushed at Adivasis in so, so many different ways. The, the ways they are mocked or made to feel inferior when actually, from my point of view, they, they have so much. You have so much to be proud of. It's really, really um, mind-blowing how much you have to be proud of. And yet, because that tradition of looking at some people as developed, others as undeveloped or whatever, and the other aspect is education, and because the missionaries, when they started making schools in India, they were consciously trying to create a tribal elite, and they have created it. And in, in, in America and Australia, at the same time when they started in residential schools for indigenous people, they had a different aim. The aim was assimilation, as you mentioned, cultural genocide. And I'm afraid now the residential schools for tribal children in India, the aim is what it was in America. It is cultural genocide. They're consciously trying to force an assimilation by manipulating the aspirations of the youth to have what the rich people have, to be like the rich people, to be like the us decadent Western people, like we have destroyed the earth. Our way of forced industrialization has destroyed the earth by creating wants and turning real human needs into wants. So that wants, wanting a car, wanting the new model, model of mobile, comes to seem more important than your own community. And what is so amazing about Adivasi life is, is the sense of community. And I see so many ways, from mining companies to school teachers to politicians that are creating divisions, class divisions and competition, like in tribal value system, actually sharing is a far more important value than competition. Competition, the modern Western world is teaching, is very good in politics, but what do we see as a result? It's just competing parties for advantage. It's very good in business and economics, competitive economy, but then everybody is trying to get advantage over other instead of exchange on a fair basis and exchange labor. And in education, competition, who is doing better in exams? In law, who is winner, who is loser? Instead of the tribal aim of the legal process, as I understand it, was reconciliation. And how more civilized, how more beautiful can you get than that? Yeah. But then, uh, right from my childhood, or uh, if I go before, like since 1950, if you uh, see the, yeah. all the government documents, yeah. Every time they are saying that we have to mainstream Adivasi, they are mm. non-stream. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But then when I see the so-called mainstream, I find that rape is there, molestation is there, killing, stealing, everything, you know, all the kind of crimes you will find in so-called mainstream. Absolutely. On I mean, other hand, in Adivasi society, we live in with the forest, yeah, we yeah. live in community, yeah. sharing, caring, equality, fraternity, everything you will find here. Absolutely. So my question is, to you is that who has decided the mainstream? Who decides actually? I would say the economists, the World Bank. <laughs> I mean, it's that because they are controlling the financial system. And if you look at Ranchi, where we were today, the center of Ranchi is like a hell space of competing motorbikes and traffic and and I once went with some Dongria from Niamgiri to Delhi where they were going to make statements and they were really amazed to see Delhi how poor people are there how dangerous it is to cross the road how there is no food growing no fresh food or water available they think what is this Delhi this capital city that people are aspiring so, really, the mainstream 
<laughs> we should all be leaving the mainstream. Uh, now, what I see that the Indian state is determined to grab our remaining natural resources mm. and hand it over to the corporate. Mm. In this situation, what kind of future do you see for the Adivasis? Not just the Adivasis, but this future is complete hell because, like, as you know, I've written this book about the the bauxite mountains in Orissa and Andhra Pradesh and a bit in Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand. Each one of them has a mining company or several mining companies trying to get hold of them. Even within the time I've worked, Baplamale and Kodingamale in South Orissa are being mined for bauxite now. When you mine a mountain for bauxite, you kill the water sources from there. And how much mining is happening in Jharkhand? How bad the water situation has got? And the more mining you do, already there has been far too much mining. It's like, who can stop mining? But um, already far too much has been done. It's just for short-term advantage, the market is dictating, and yet it is literally destroying the ecosystems that support the life. I mean, climate change, it's the, it's the carbon deposit, ca carbon emissions coming from the factories, but it's also the extraction of water completely beyond any limit. So the government of India, actually the statistics are there. The groundwater depletion is incredibly dangerous. Nobody talks about that or is conscious of that. And every new factory extracts every new man mine damages the un under under channels of water so really people should wake up and the conservationists should really be working with the advice is very hard to give this message and the economists need to then understand the ecosystems that are the base of all human well-being that we are destroying our mother it's uh, you have seen that uh, how majority of the indians are still celebrating instant justice what happened in hyderabad actually i would say not just instant justice but, but it is a brutal killing mm. Cold blooded murder. Lynching. It, it lynching. Is lynching. Lynching yeah. is turned as a or coined as a instant justice. So, what kind of future India would have? It is actually destruction of justice because you and I know how many thousands of people have been killed who are innocent as if they're criminals because often it's easier for police to target poor people who look dirty and unkempt and can be made to look like easy scapegoats rather than going after the real villains and whether the people who were killed by the police suddenly were the actual rapists or not it's very hard now to know but actually from the way that they were killed i would probably guess that they probably were not the actual rapists and when the poor people are rapists we know that of course everybody loves to hate them but what about when the rapists are police? There are thousands of police who have committed rape who are never punished. And when the rapists are rich people, I mean, such double standards are there. So, uh, do you see that caste operates everywhere in India? I think certainly it's it does. I mean... Uh, and who can say whether when it's caste, when it's class, and when it's education, that people who have certain education qualifications think they're absolutely above the rest, when actually education should be opening the mind. Instead, with these qualifications, it's like it closes the mind until some of the most educated people are the most narrow-minded human beings you can meet, who have no opening for actually seeing what's in front of their eyes. So, what would be your final message on the International Day of Human Rights? That really there is nothing more important. Like the Prime Minister of Iceland was saying three days ago, 
There is nothing more important than human well-being and human rights and kindness of one human being to another. And when somebody is done injustice, whether they're rich and powerful or in uniform, they should be brought to justice and they should not think they're above the law. It, it's such a simple um, understanding. And for India, this great country that truly I, I love and it has given me so much, but to see it doing so badly in human rights is a very, very sad thing. It really, it just needs, um, nobody should be above the law, S as simple as that. And justice is, there is no future without justice. Yeah, great, Felix. So thank you so much for sharing your ideas, views. So thank you so much. Yeah. Uh -huh.